So I'm glad to see so many people here today. And uh, I'm delighted to, men to, to welcome Conal O'Farrinta here. Conal is a, a senior and investigative reporter with the Irish Examiner. Um, he's done an awful lot of really good work on uh, the investigation into illegal adoptions and deaths in mother and baby homes in Ireland. Now, you all probably became aware of this story when uh, last year this uh, historian, Catherine Corliss, raised concerns about these deaths uh, in a mother's and baby's home in Tune. And uh, something like a thousand babies, uh, you know, had been buried there. But Caha was actually the man who did this original story. And uh, he, he spent a lot of time uh, with documentary evidence and interviewing people and getting the story. He's going to talk to you about that today. And he also did some work on a mother's and baby home <coughs> called the Bestborough, isn't it, in Cork? Yeah, Bestborough. Where um, there was alarming kind of statistics about the fact uh, something like 478 ba babies had died in that home between 1934 and 54, which was a huge amount. And there was also uh, an investigation that uh, raised concerns about the fact that they thought some of the death certs had actually been falsified and that the children had actually been, you know, sold on an adoption in the States. So he's going to talk to you today about illegal adoptions, the deaths in mother and baby homes, and the story that keeps on breaking, and how he managed to get those stories. And really what I think you'll find interesting about this, because you're all at the moment doing FOIs and trying to get documentary evidence, or people to talk to you about something that obviously is controversial. So um, I'd like you to give him a warm welcome, okay? Thanks very much. So just at the start, um, if you ever if you just want to stop me at any point and ask me any questions on anything, just fire away. I kind of find it easier if it's more conversational rather than me just kind of talking away. Um, so I suppose, uh, yeah, a little bit about me. I, I started in journalism in The Examiner in 2008. Before that, I'd worked in a, a local paper in Cavan um, and just kind of luckily got my arse on a seat in The Examiner and have been there ever since. Um, I suppose I, I'm a general reporter like everybody else and this was something I just kind of stumbled into and I suppose it's, it's something I, I think is useful for people is that sometimes you just a story kind of arrives at your desk and you fall into it almost and next thing, ten years later, you're still bloody writing about it. And that's kind of what happened to me. Um, I had been writing on inter-country inter adoption, so foreign adoption waiting lists that people had been... Um, that couples looking to adopt were waiting quite a long time to be assessed for adoption. Again, just a story that came my way. I had no particular interest in it. Um, but as a result, I, I started reading around the legislation at the time, and there was an Oireachtas Committee hearing. And I was reading back on Oireachtas Committee hearings from 2005, and I saw Susan Lohan from the Adoption Rights Alliance was there, and she had mentioned the word illegal adoptions. So, of course, being a journalist, I thought the word illegal and adoption, uh, there's probably a story in that. Um, I had heard nothing about illegal adoptions, didn't know whether it was anything to write home about. So just on a whim, I rang Susan, and she said, Jesus, you know, you're the first journalist to have rung me in about 10 years on this. And she started explaining that there was potentially a huge scandal in all of this, that there's so many children from the 60s right through to the 80s had been adopted on questionable consent forms, fraudulent documentation. Um, so I was completely blown away. Now, I was about 20 six at the time so I didn't really know anything about anything so I decided might as well meet her went up to Dublin uh, met her in Dublin and there was another woman with her uh, who she just happened to bump into on the day and she was a natural mother so she had lost a child to adoption herself and we had a chat for about an hour and lo and behold this woman mentioned an, a woman called Tressa Reeves who she'd been working with now Tressa was from Penzance in England and she had been pregnant in 19, I have this written down, 1961, she fell pregnant as a 21-year-old. And she's lovely English, as English a lady as you could meet, um, but her parents were Irish. So her parents said, you're going to Ireland, you're not having this child in our house. This child is to be gotten rid of, we don't want to see anything about it. So this child was, she was sent to Dublin, she stayed in a nursing home in Dublin, which isn't a nursing home for the elderly, this would have been a place where women were sent to uh, have children in secret, essentially, and you paid to be there. Um, she gave birth and christened the child in the room herself. She named the child Andre. 
she, the following day, the child was taken from her and she was driven to a place in Dublin called St. Patrick's Guild. And in St. Patrick's Guild, they arranged for the child to be adopted, but it wasn't a legal adoption. What happened was the adoptive parents took the child and were told, take the child and register the child as if it was born to you. So essentially, they arranged for the birth cert to be falsified. So it, this child would grow up thinking that his adoptive parents were in fact his real parents and he would never know that he was adopted. So I was completely, mind was blown that this could have happened. In a, so I pitched the story and I went to Penzance and I interviewed Tressa and I wrote a large kind of two day series on her story and kind of around the legislation in Ireland, which makes it's pretty very difficult to trace if you're an adopted person. You have, less legal rights than other people. Um, you've no right to, no, no legal right to your birth cert, you've no legal right to your medical, original medical history, things like that. But Tressa had every piece of paper I could have wanted. She had boxes of stuff. Um, it, you know, it was a fascinating story um, and a very sad story, a very emotional story for her because she only managed to get the birth corrected in the general registration office. So she had went to the GRO in Dublin, which registers all, all birth deaths and marriages and said, um, I had a, had a child in 1961. It, birth was never correctly registered. I wanted to register. I want to register it now, 50 years after the fact, and that is more difficult than you would think to do. Um, but she got it done, and in 2000, what is it? Year 2009, she formalised the birth. So her son has two birth certs. He has his correct birth cert, and he also has the birth cert he thinks is his own, which says his not adoptive parents are his natural parents. So to me, that just opened up a whole world of how many people did this happen to? How many people are out there that are living on fraudulent documentation and have no idea? Um, so I wrote the story. Everything I had was there. And I got a, it got a, quite a large reaction. Primetime followed up on it. Um, but I suppose the lesson I, I, I... I'm trying to pick a few stories that I think that I learned something from. I was starting out, and I suppose what I, what I got from it is if you see something, like all I saw were the words illegal adoption, and I just picked up the phone and said, there might be nothing in it, there might be something in it. So I couldn't encourage you more to just go on your gut. Like if you see something that just doesn't stick right with you, a few phone calls, meet people, and see, chase it down and see what happens. Now, on the flip side of that, I probably missed a trick in the story because it, it, I won an award for it and it did very well and all the rest. But I suppose where I, how I write now is slightly different. I tend to focus less on the emotional stories, on, you know, the individual story about, you know, a very sad story about this woman, and, her, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the media about this subject particularly is about people meeting, tracing relatives after 50 years, and it's all very emotive and sad, but it, it misses the kind of key nub of what happened and how it was done and who was involved in doing it, who was involved in contracting the illegal adoption, and it's a system, and that's what interested me, because the name St. Patrick's Guild. Now, if I was writing the story, I'd go straight after St. Patrick's Guild. I would go, how many other people did this happen to? What's their role? Who was involved there? What were they doing? So I suppose, again, there's lessons in it. It was a good story, and I'm very proud of it. But And I mean, I'm still very close to Tressa, and I still write about her. Um, but to me, it was more that it revealed something else. It revealed that this was a wider system. There was thousands, potentially, of Tressa Reeves out there. Um, and now we know through movies like Philomena that there are thousands of women out there who this kind of thing happened to. Um, so I suppose, yeah, that's, that, that was my intro into it. Um, and from there, I suppose, I learned quickly enough that illegal adoption was what I wanted to write about if, if, in terms of a, a long-term story. Um, so again, the difficulty is, and you, you guys will know, I, I heard you talking about freedom of information requests and all the rest, that's, that's where this story goes, essentially, is that you have to try and access documentation. Um, it's one thing having someone tell you their story, but if they don't have a paper trail to back it up, you can't really write it. Um, you know, it's a lot of she, she claims this, he claims that, or whatever. Um, but you can't argue with paper. Um, so I suppose what I started doing then was chasing down how does legal adoption work? who was involved, how many agencies, and I specifically went after St. Patrick's Guild quite a lot because once I wrote the story, people started phoning me. And that's another thing you'll, I mean, people talk about developing sources, that's how it happens. You know, you write a story, um, and it gets, if it gets a reaction, people will ring you and start asking. I'm a, within a day, I had people ringing me going, can you help me trace my daughter or whatever? And I'm going, I have no idea how to do that. You know, I, like I was 20, 25, 26 at the time. 
but I knew then that this was something that had struck a chord and affected quite a lot of people more than they let on, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I gradually started writing more and more about St. Patrick's Guild and illegal adoptions. Now, this was, again, long before um, Tune, so I suppose that's where, where it all kind of changed. Um, I mean, I, I, most of this stuff that I had written on St. Patrick's Guild wasn't generating any kind of traction at all. Um, you know, they were popping up in, in, in the examiner and they were putting some of them on page one and I started to write then about mother and baby homes because, you know, children would have been adopted through these adoption agencies that would have come from mother and baby homes originally. Um, so the mother would have gone to Bespera or Sean Ross Abbey or Castle Pollard, these big boy mother and baby homes, the child would be born, the child was then adopted through an adoption agency and was, this was contracted in whatever fashion it was contracted in. So I started to write a lot about Bespera because I'm based in Cork and you know people would tell me information about it um, but again none of this was making any waves you know this wasn't like it is now with you know tune is everywhere and it went all around the world um, but I started writing about the records um, which is now a big issue because the, the, even the commission now that's investigating all of this is saying that they're struggling with uh, the amount and the volume of records that they have to go through so uh, like prime example RT led with, when the tune babies thing broke RT led with a story about, I think, 15,000 files that Bespera had transferring to the state in 2011. I had written the story three and a half years earlier. Over a period of about two months, I was writing it continually. And yet, like, the, the news led with it. I was kind of going, that was slightly soul-destroying. <laughs> but again, some of what you do is thankless. You know, you end up just writing about it because you care about it when nobody else does. Um, but Tume changed everything. I mean, once the Tume story broke, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, you probably were all aware of it. Um, you all know what the Tume story is, do you? Yeah, so the babies found in Tume, 796 children found. Um, in a grave. In a yeah. mass grave. Um, so we, again... Sorry, we, we have some students from America. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. About. I'm probably talking so, too fast. Uh, well, just over. explain what Tune is about. So Tune, was, a, um, about. Tune yeah. was one of these mother and baby homes um, in the west of Ireland. Um, and I, I had done, I'd heard very little about it actually uh, before it broke. Um, I, I'd heard, I'll get to it, I'd heard kind of murmurings. But um, so a local historian in, in Galway had pulled the death certs for the children that died in this home. Um, over a period of I think it was around 40 years and found there were 796 children died there and they were all buried in one plot um, and the story had been out before I think it had been in the in, in local papers in Galway um, but it, it ended up in the Daily Mail um, and on the Daily Mail website which is one of the most read news websites in the world <laughs> and then it was on US news and of course in classic Irish style once it became an international story it was decided on hi Jesus we better do something about it so a uh, state inquiry was launched, and here we are, we're in the middle of the state inquiry. It's gone on for, it's gone on for three years, and they've just recently extended the time frame again. Um, so when that broke, of course, everyone was writing about Tune, and it was all about Tune, and it was all about death. And for me, that was missing the wider story, because it's about more than one institution. It's about a wider system of institutions, and it's also not just about deaths. It's about people who are living now, people who are adopted, or mothers who, whose children did not die, and have been asking questions as to how their children were adopted. But of course that gets lost in the kind of media storm that was Tune. But, and I suppose this is kind of my second point to you would be, like always go further. Like when I wrote Tress's story, I mean I got a lot of praise for it and it was a great story and it's very easy to just go, right what will I do next? But if the trick is to really go in, go after more, because if, if, if your suspicion is there's more there, chase it, go after it, even if you're not getting anywhere with it. Because I knew that this was a big story in 2008, 2009, and not just deaths on, on the whole thing. But I didn't, I didn't let it go. I, I, you know, FOI, I FOI'd everything I could get on God, Jesus. I was FOI about, you know, how many discussions the department was having with said agencies on the subject of illegal registrations and, you know, getting knockbacks and, you know, because I knew there was more there and I knew if you keep plugging away, you'll get somewhere. Um, so when Tune broke, I then refocused my issue on, and this is a big thing of mine anyway, is that 
there's always a narrative that you're being sold. You know, you're being told, like the story now is, we all know about mother and baby homes because um, of the great work Catherine Cortlis did, which is undoubtedly brilliant work, um, and that nobody in the government knew anything about it. Um, you know, they were all up there wringing their hands going, how could this have happened in, you know, dark days of Ireland, and it was a sad place in our history. Um, and I didn't buy that for a second because I was well aware that they were far more knowledgeable on what was going on in these institutions than they had let on. Um, so that was, my goal then is to refocus the narrative or try and change the narrative. Don't just report what is there, what you're being told, that, you know, we didn't know anything about it and now we have a state inquiry and aren't we great? So I set out to try and see, well, did anyone know about it? Were we ever aware of Tune beforehand? Um, and of course, this document tells that we were, because, um, so Tune broke in 2014, and I'll just find my, um, and I managed to get my hands on this document, which is from 2012. So it's interesting in a number of reasons. So in 2012, we were examining the Magdalene Laundries through the McAleese Inquiry. And again, another bugbear of mine is how we examine everything in isolation in Ireland. Whereas, Colin, you might will you explain what Magdalene Laundries are because they don't know. Oh yeah, Mag okay. Magdalene yeah. Laundries were different to mother and baby homes. They were essentially where women who didn't, who were deemed not to fit the kind of social ideal of the time, or unruly women, or they could have been in there for being too attractive, any reason. They were basically put to work in what were known as Magdalene Laundries, washing clothes, washing linen on behalf of religious orders um, who were, had contracts from the state to do this work. And some they got no pay? No pay, yeah. And a lot of these women stayed there, some of them stayed there for the rest of their lives and died there. Um, anyway, there was an inquiry into this in 2012. But I mean, women would have been sent from, when they finished in a mother and baby home, some women transferred to Magdalene Laundries, which to me, is, again, it's all part of the one story. It's all one system. But we examine everything in isolation like it's separate. And that kind of dilutes the story. You know, it, it makes it kind of like mother and baby homes are totally different to Magdalene Laundries. I mean, I remember writing when the McAleese apology happened. There was a state apology to the women in the Magdalene Laundries. And I remember writing at the time, next will be the mother and baby homes. And lo and behold, here we are X number of years later, and we have another state inquiry into mother and baby homes. But as part of that work, the HSE was examining, um, again, this was all happening behind the scenes, was examining the routes of entry and exit from Magdalene Laundries. So where women went before and after. And one of those routes would have been to mother and baby homes. So this document came into my possession uh, and it's from, when was it, October 2012, I think. So, and they're specifically talking about the Vesper and Tune mother and baby home. And remember, this is two years before Tune becomes this international sensation. So uh, it's from Phil Garland, the Vida Della Harpy. Phil Garland was the, um, was a senior, senior management in the HSC, he's uh, gone now, I believe. So they're talking about what, that they had discovered an archive in relation to the Tomb Mother Mary home. And where is the lines? So again, you can see some of it is dynamite for me. A, a large archive of photographs, documentation, and correspondence relating to children sent for documents to the USA. Uh, some of the correspondence relates to the bishops writing to the Magdalene homes, but the content is not yet clear, it's not known, blah, blah, blah. There are letters from mother and baby homes to parents asking for money to the upkeep of their children. The average duration of these babies stay in the home in Tume is not yet known, but t taking the home in Vesper as an example, it may be that the stays are prolonged for financial reasons. So there's another interesting line. So they're prolonging the stay for financial reasons, but it's also telling me they, they were looking at Tume two years before, before Catherine Corliss broke her story. One thing I'll clear, however, is that more than one letter uh, to a parent or parents asking for money for an infant that has been discharged or died. So they're looking for money for children that are gone. So you can see where this is all going. And next, we see there's a database of a thousand names. Um, and it's not yet clear whether these relate to an ongoing examination or are they related to the adoption of children by parents, possibly to the USA. So again, I'm reading this, and it took me a long time to get it with. This was dynamite for me. So, um, <coughs> and this is the key stuff at the bottom here. I remember two years before, we had them standing up on the doll saying, God, isn't it terrible what happened? And thank, thank God for Captain Corliss, or we'd have never known. It was agreed that I would draft an early warning, one page or two page letter to FAO Philip Crowley, suggesting that this goes all the way up to the minister. This may prove to be a scandal that dwarfs other more recent issues of the church and state because of the very emotive 
sensitive sensitivities around adoption of babies with or without the will of the mother. A concern is that if there is evidence of trafficking babies, it must have been facilitated by doctors, social workers, etc. And a number of these health professionals may still be working in the system. It is important to send this up to the minister as soon as possible with a view to an interdepartment committee and a fully fledged, fully resourced forensic investigation and state inquiry. So the HSC was, was, was telling this a, a top civil service, is it? Yeah. This, this was the HSE when they were examining the Magdalene laundries. A social worker in Galway found yeah. an archive in relation to Tume right. and was so concerned about what they had found. Right. A teleconference call was arranged with Davida Della Harpy and Phil Garland. Phil Garland was the uh, Deputy National Director for Child and Family Services. Okay, yeah. And the long shot of their discussion was that this needs to go to the Minister yeah. and there needs to be a state inquiry into what we have found. Yeah, I'm not asking you your source, but they'd be interested. Somebody that you obviously knew felt you should see that. Yes, yeah. Because it would be very hard for journalists to get that. Yeah. Would you be able um, to explain to them why we normally wouldn't get those kind of documents? <laughs> well, I think those three lines would be yeah, good reason why you wouldn't get them. Um, I mean, I, first of all, you've got to know to F a white. So, yeah. I, you know, I had known that there was issues around tomb. Well, you got that through F a white. Uh, no, I didn't, know. But, if, but my point being, no, I'm not asking no but my point, it, it's a good question because the yeah. point is how to know what to FOI. Yeah. I wouldn't have known that that was there. Yeah. I mean, if I had wanted a great story, I couldn't have typed a document up that would read better than that. But somebody that you obviously know, because they're yeah. doing this at the moment, yes, yeah. felt that you should have know, this material, yeah. Know, uh, uh, have this to help you get the story. Yeah. And that helped you to form your FOI. Well, no, because no, the, this just was given to me. Oh, you got it, okay, yeah. By someone. By someone who felt you yeah. got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm well aware so. this is going on YouTube, no, so. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> no, I, I, the reason I'm just asking it is because they're at a stage where they're trying to write stories, yeah. either from sources who don't want to be mentioned, yeah, yeah. or documentary evidence. Well, uh, well, I put it this way. I, I think the reason. How it, how it came into your hands. I, I, I like. Because I've been writing about this for so long, so like bear, bear in mind that this is 2014, yeah. and everyone is writing about it. I've been writing about it since, you know, late 2008, 2009, yeah. and like with very little traction. So when it comes to somebody saying, when they're hearing people stand up from the doll, politicians saying, "Well, we had no idea, and isn't it terrible?" and this person is saying, "That's a load of shit." Yeah. Um, when they think of someone to maybe talk to, and you Google a lot of this stuff on Vespera, most of the stuff that comes up is me. Right, okay. So they were aware of, presumably, the work I had done and felt that I had done a decent job on it. And that's another point I would make. Like, that's, that's the kind of, the benefit of sticking with something. Yes, And just being good. dogged, you know. And being associated with a story. Yeah, like, yeah. even if it kind of breaks your heart, like, that you're, you're not getting any credit for it, or that it's, no, people aren't seeing it like you see it, which I felt a lot on this, because I, I think this is the biggest... As they say, this could be a scandal at the wharf, so all of the scandals between church and state. That, I felt that for years. Yeah. But I was writing stories and going, nobody else bloody thinks so. Right. Um, okay. So, yeah, like that, that's, that's how I got it. But the other point I'd make about is sometimes you need more important than, okay, sometimes you get stuff, right, and it's, it's great. And in that case, I got material which was, was dynamite, you know, for me. Yeah. Um, but other times it's, it's, it's with FOIs is your problem is, is knowing what to ask. And the best way sometimes with, with good sources is that you protect them by just saying to them, a lot of people think you just ring someone up and go, God, you know, if they'll tell you something. You go, have you got it on paper? Can you give it to me? And they'll go, oh, geez, I can't give it to you. The next thing to say is, well, can you tell me what to ask for? Yeah. Um, because that protects them. Because yeah. then you can do a, a targeted FOI or a slightly wider FOI than you really need just to kind of, you know, put them off the scent a little bit. Yes. But that's what you, you, you need someone to tell you what's there, even if they won't give it to you. Yeah. And then you can go after it. But yeah, a lot of the time with right. FOIs is you, you kind of don't know what you're looking for. You know, but you know you have a suspicion that something is there. And then you put in a, a wide ranging FOI and they come back to you and they go, oh, it's too wide. Can you narrow it down? And that's another big one, the narrowing down business. <laughs> I have a real issue with that because I row with them all the time on this. Uh, how do I know what I'm narrowing down? 
well, like, maybe you could narrow it down to this year's. And I go, but say, oh, they'll say, narrow it down to between 2000 and 2004 or whatever. And I go, but how do I know the, the information in 2005 isn't brilliant? Oh, well, you know, I'm not just going to trust them, you know? So, and that's, I've, I've gone to the information commission on that point, is that you're always requested to narrow your search, but you're narrowing it in the dark. You don't know what's there. So how are you expected to know? So, um, but that, that, uh, that's a big lesson in FOI, I think, is finding people that will tell you what to look for, or tell you what questions to ask. Um, that's, that's almost as good as them giving it to you. Um, okay, you gotta wait for it, and you gotta go through the, the torture that can, FOI can be. Um, but you know, F FOI is terrible in this country, but if you're, if you're and I was saying to you outside, if, if you're, the trick in it is just to be a bit of a bastard and, and just stay on it, you know, like, you'll get it back within four weeks. If you don't get it back within the statutory time, immediately internally review it. I do that now, I, I don't wait. You know, if, Will you explain to them how that works? So if you put an FOI request, you're, you're supposed to get a response within four weeks. Um, but if you don't get it, that can be treated as a deemed refusal you, that, under the legislation. So you can say, well, I've been refused and you can seek to internally review the request, which means someone above your FOI officer's grade then has to review the FOI. So there's two benefits to that. It's the person who has not given you a response within four weeks probably gets a bit of a lecture saying, why didn't you turn this up? Now I have to deal with it. So it's good for you because then it puts a bit of focus on them. They don't like them. So I just internally review it. If it's not back in four weeks, internally review it. It goes up the chain and they have to respond. I'm not sure the time frame was an internal review. How would you like it to get an internal review now? Oh, you just, you just write back to the... So when you put in your FOI, you get your FOI officer or whatever. And they say, we'll respond to you on whatever date. And if you don't get a response, I'd pick up the call, phone, and if it's not in the post, I'd be going, I'm going to internally review it. Just email them back and go, I wish this, I seek to internally review this request. Then it's looked at again. Um, and if they refuse you, internally review it. I go through every single, all the way, to try and get uh, an FOI out. Because so many people will think, ah, they just refused it, and sure, like, what can I do? But you can, like, you, you have to... <coughs> You have to play them at their own game as well, you know. Um, like on this stuff, I had, I mean, I'll get to it a, a bit later, I'm probably like way behind anyway, but um, I was trying to FOI um, a death register and related to material, and it was it really took forever. It was months and months and months, and they were, I mean, I couldn't, I didn't even get a response initially, and I didn't know who the, the, freedom, the officer dealing with it was, so I, I didn't know who the decision maker was, so I'm ringing around people in, the, in Tusla saying, um, who's dealing with my request, couldn't get them. Eventually I did, then I was over and back, and it was delayed and delayed and delayed, and then they refused it. And it was just after Christmas, and I was going, Jesus, I waited months for this, and they've just now refused it. And they said, they, I, can't, I don't know what section of the act it was, but it was that the request would um, interfere unduly with the workings of the department. So basically, they're too busy to do it. So I had, and another lesson is, do everything on email with them, and an FOI is my... Like, it's one thing to pick up the phone and they go, oh, well, we have this, that, and the other. And, and then if you have to query it and you say, well, I was told this, I mean, it's not an email, it's, it's worthless to you. Um, so I had on email from about two months earlier the FOI officer saying, oh, well, I've just gone through all of your material and it's, it's pretty much all redacted and it's, I'm just waiting for a decision. So I responded to the refusal by saying, how can you say it interferes unduly with the working of the department when the work on my FOI was already done <coughs> two months ago? couldn't have interfered with anything because he'd already completed it. And lo and behold, they overturned it and released the information to me. So it's stuff like that, you just have to kind of, if they refuse you under something, check what it is in the legislation and query it. You know, don't be afraid to, you know, like that's what it's there for. Um, like if, and, and don't let them string you along, like don't let them string it out for months on end, you know. You have to, you have to take ownership of it. Like it's, it's an FOI is more than just putting it in. You know, you have to chase it up, because if people don't, it just, they just don't go anywhere. Um, no, I didn't get this under FOI, but anyway. Um, so yeah, to get back to this. So another thing I'm a big guy on is this changed the narrative of how we understand tomb. I hope because it put the onus back in the the, the, the court of the state because I was writing stories saying they were well aware of tomb two years earlier when they were looking at the Magdalene Laundries. And you'd think someone would have done, about, done something about it, but they didn't. Um, and 
along with this document, I got another document, which was prepared at the same time that this document was written, and it was a report into the best for mother and baby home, which was about 20 pages long. Um, and I got, I, funny enough, I was on a stag do when I got this, and I, was, I remember trying to read it all drunk mm -hmm. at the time, um, and going, this is bloody brilliant. Uh, but yeah, the best for one, again, it was great. I mean, it was, like, it was like a Christmas present because it was the same, it was the same point. The Bespera report raised the matter of debts specifically within the first few paragraphs. It said they had, um, this was prepared by someone who had accessed the records of Bespera every single day. This was, um, the records of Bespera by now are in the hands of the state. So this was, they're with Tusla. So someone in there, when they were researching the Magdalene Laundries, wrote a report specifically on Bespera, raising issues about how adoptions were contracted, there was a preoccupation with wealth amongst the order that, that jumps out you from the documents, um, the treatment of women there, and specifically refers to the issue of debts. And uh, shocking was the word used, shocking rate of infant mortality. Um, and I have it, where is it, where did I write it? Yeah. And pointed to the need uh, that there was, was in fact a death register in Bespera, which was handed over to the state in 2011, which had the details of 470 children and 10 women who died in Bespera between 1934 and 1953. Now that's, that was a higher death rate than Chum, which caused an international scandal. So again, my point was the narrative is now changing. Someone in the HSE wrote a report on this and raised that there was a death register given to them by the nuns. So again, my point being, if the word of Catherine Corliss was good enough for a state inquiry in 2014, why was the word of the HSE not good enough two years earlier? And again, I think it's pretty obvious that without media attention, June would never have gone anywhere. Um, and in fact, they had, all the work was done for them. The death register had the names, the ages of death, the cause of death, everything they could possibly have needed. And yet, nothing happened. Um, when I wrote the story and the report was, I, again, I did a two-day series with the Bespa report and this, um, I, I mean, to me, I'd nailed everything. I mean, I had that the state was well aware of issues of deaths in two institutions long before the whole tune story broke, um, and that this material that was so concerning, the minister should have been informed, and two departments, the, the DC Department of Children and Youth Affairs said that they had not seen the Bespa report, and subsequently they changed their tune on that, and in fact, two departments had seen the Bespa report, and the defence of it was, well, this was all conjecture, this report, there was nothing in it that was concrete and we wrote back and said well if there's any validated findings of concern uh, they should be investigated separately because it was outside the remit of the Magdalene Laundry inquiry. Now again I took issue with the word use of the word conjecture. It's true in the report that the author uses the word conjecture but she was specifically referring to her opinions on certain aspects saying this is what I think looking at the records. But what was not in dispute was that there was a death register and that it contained the names of hundreds of children. There was no way that that could be queried. So again, to me, that's about changing the story, changing the narrative. And again, that only happens when you don't accept a line, that, uh, what you're being told. That you, if you're long enough on a story, you go, yeah, like, is it, is it good enough to just hear a politician say, we didn't know about Chum and we're going to do something about it now? Uh, no, it's not. So you kind of go, well, there must be something else there. Because again, that's about going deeper, digging for more, um, and yeah, changing the narrative. That to me, that that to me, all good journalism is about that. Um, not being spun a line, not being, you know, sit. It's why I, I, I briefly did uh, was up in the the doll office, the political office, and I hate years ago when I was an in intern, and, and I hated it because it's lots of stuff like briefings and press releases, and you know, like you sit there and someone tells you this is what the government is doing, this is what we're saying, and that's what you read. Whereas this kind of work allows you to kind of go, well, no, that's not what was said. This is not what's happening. Um, and it's true. It's, 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 it's a truer version of the events. And it also makes sure that the state will be held accountable for issues around Tume and issues around Bespera and all of the other homes. Um, now, we wouldn't have gotten it without Catherine Corliss, but I wasn't going to let them off the hook by saying, I'm sure we did our best like and we didn't know. Um, because it was a crop. Um, 
so I'm pretty proud of that story. Um, yeah, so, and again, I suppose the next kind of piece of that puzzle was, again, by not resting on your laurels. Like, that was a great story, and I had the fact that there was now, we had now moved the site of infant deaths from Tume to another site, where there was a large number of infant deaths. So I decided, well, I have a number, but now I'll go and see, can I get the register itself? So I FOI'd everything I could get on Bespera, um, including the death register, anything to do with financial records. Um, and again, that was a, just a, an almighty battle. Um, because I wanted to see what this death register looked like and what it said. Um, because all I had was a few lines in a report. So what happened then was, uh, and again, this is the same reason why I say about sources and how you get them is that, again, someone just picked up the phone to me and said, here's something you should see. And that's just because I keep writing about this stuff. And because that's why I said it's a story that keeps on breaking. Because essentially I'm writing the same story for the last nine years, just different aspects of a system. It's all about the same issue. Um, and sometimes that's what it requires. You just have to keep writing about it. Um, so when I had published the story on Best, this and the report on Best Road, which raised the number of deaths, Someone contacted me to say they had state inspection reports from the time and that it, they had a different number of deaths or that there was, he had queried whether the deaths matched the deaths I had. So again, there you go, that was another interesting line. Because the two things I took from that report was that the concern was raised that deaths may have been falsified so that children could be brokered in clandestine adoption arrangements was the line that was used. And... So that, to me, was an interesting line because it was something I had kind of suspected. You know, when you start hearing that such large numbers of children are dying in an institution, you start to wonder, where are they all? And is it really realistic that 80% of children born in an institution die? I mean, in one case, I think in Bespera, 102 out of 120-something children died. And again, that's, again, question the narrative, question everything. If I was going, is it true? What happens if they didn't die? Now, I have no proof of that, didn't know, but I said it's worth going after. This guy contacted me with these state inspection reports because all of these institutions were inspected by the state. And he said, if you want them, you can have them, you just didn't get them from me. Um, and he sent them on. And they marked out the number of deaths in Bespera. There was a woman called Dr. Alice Lister who was in a state inspector. She went to Bespera in, in the 40s. And she got the, the deaths for 39, 40, 1941, 42, 43, 44. And they're all there in the report. So I said, Jesus, if I get this death register and I compare the two figures, and if they match, all well and good, but if they don't match, there's a story. Particularly when the concern had been raised that deaths have been falsified. So this, that was my goal. So I FOI'd this register, but I had to get the register a certain way because they wanted to redact everything. So... And this is kind of another lesson in FOI, I think, as well, and it's kind of partly trusting your gut, too, is that in the, in the state inspection reports, the deaths are recorded for the year ending March 31st, so I had to get the dates in the register, because I had to be able to compare the years in the same way, otherwise I wasn't counting like what like. So they wanted to redact everything. So I just give me a blank death register, it's great, it's just pages. Um, so... I said, no problem, I don't care who the, the... I don't need the names. You know, the names, in a sense, don't interest me. Again, I'm all about the system. I'm all about how it operates, what's going on. The names are incidental. Um, uh, not to sound callous about it, but, you know, that, that's... They try to get around everything by saying it's personal data or whatever. I said, redact every name in the book, I don't care. Um, so, you know, that was proving kind of difficult. So I just came clean with the FOI officer. And sometimes that, that's something you should do if you think it will further your case. I said... I'll tell you why I want the death register, because I have these other documents, and they have numbers in them, and they're for these specific specific time periods. They're for the year ending March 31st, so I need the register with the dates, because I need to be able to count like what like. And I wouldn't normally do that, but I felt maybe by just telling her what I was doing, she might be a bit more understanding about it. And they were, and they released it, and I got it, and the figures don't match. So... I mean, I read them out. So, like, for 1939, the state inspection report had 38 deaths and the register had 38 deaths. That's fine. 1940, the inspection report had 17 deaths and the death register had 8 deaths. So you can see where it's going. 
State Inspector State Inspection Report in 41 had 38 deaths. It had 22 deaths on the register. Uh, subsequent years, it was 47 deaths versus 43 deaths, 70 deaths versus 55 deaths. And for the my big year, which was 1944, where there was an 82% death rate, there was 102 deaths reported to the state inspector. But the death register held by the order records 76 deaths. So there's a discrepancy in total of 80. So I was wondering, why are they over-reporting? Why are they telling the state inspector and uh, state inspectors that there's more children dying than they're actually recording. And again, I don't know. <laughs> it's the answer. I'm still trying to work it out. But that's enough for a story, particularly on the back of a previous report that you had, which says there was a concern that deaths may have been falsified. So you're building a long-term story here by just going a step further every time. By not like, it was great to get the number of deaths in it, in that was in best, but it was a big story. But I didn't sit on it and say, okay, that's great. I said, well, is there any way to get the bloody inspection report, you know? And then when you get, or the death register, and then when you get the inspection reports, thinking that, let's compare them, you know? That's, the goal in all of this is to keep pushing it forward, keep trying to dig deeper and see what you can get. Um, and, you know, again, th these are cited all the time now. Like, this particularly is always, I mean, there was a debate in the doll last night about Tume and the delays in this, and this was wheeled out again as to hang the state on, you know, that you can't wash your hands of this anymore because you knew about it. And again, it's, again, it's only one piece of paper, but paper really matters when, it's, you know, when, when it says stuff like this. Um, yeah, um, and I suppose that's, again, all part of the narrative idea and pushing forward all, I think, pushing deeper, not sitting on a story just because you think you've figured it out. Um, yeah. Do you have any resistance within, within your own paper as to why oh, you're spending so much time on this and, you know, um, forever? Less no, no, uh, no, like, I, okay, like, I'm kind of known as a bit of an obsessive on it, uh, and they kind of take the piss out of me a bit. Um, look, I'm, I'm a general, like, I write about everything else as well, do you know what I mean? I'm a general reporter too, like, this is, like, I, I do a lot of stuff on Magdalene Laundries and uh, Mother and Baby Homes Adoption, uh, Church State stuff. Uh, that's kind of my bag, but like, you know, I, I, I do write about transport. Every, every, any story, any report that does, I do. Like, I'm not the examiner's investigative report. You know, we've Mick Clifford, who does a lot of the big special reports and that. That's not me. But I, I'll say this for the examiner, they let you have a go at something. And that's like, I was very young when I started on this, and I really knew nothing about anything. Um, but I came to my news editor and said, look, this, I think this is a good story about Tressa. And they sent me to England to interview her. You know, I don't know what, I can't speak for other newspapers, but I'm not sure Manny would give you that kind of chance when you're that young, you know, but they let me go. Um, and they knew they'd get a lot of copy out of it at the end, which is always good too, you know, because it fills a lot of space. Um, no, no, they don't. But I do a lot of it on my own time, you know, like I, I'd be pulling birth records and death records and walking around graveyards and looking at people's adoption files. And, and I mean, I have so much stuff I have boxes of stuff that I've never written about um, that is really interesting, but it's harder to hang a new story on, you know? Um, and I'll, go th I'll show one, uh, another one, which I, I hope kind of, I don't know, am I, am I really over the time? No, you're okay. Um, do you have another example? Yeah, I have yeah. Th three more spreadsheets, or three more pages, but I'll be quick. Yeah, no problem. No, um, I don't know how to move the, how do I move the page? Uh, arrow there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so this is something I got under FY, right, which doesn't look like anything, really, at the start. So this is kind of an example of trying to build a story. So I got this under FY in, with about 1,000 pages, and this was in the middle of it, and it kind of was slightly unconnected to a lot of what I FY, but funnily enough, I think it just ended up in there because they didn't know what it was, but I was glad it did. So top two lines, check the 20 files, leave, and the next one, made the changes. So this was from the best for a mother in Bailey home. So like, for obvious reasons, that's interesting to me. Why are they changing files? And why are they doing it in 2002? So there's a few problems with it, so uh, be quick. This is again about piecing together a story. This took a while. So I didn't know what, the, what these files were, what they were, what they were referenced to, but I could see they redacted names, right? So they left the first two in, Magdalene, thinking that that meant Magdalene woman. It doesn't. So women who went to mother and baby homes were given house names. They were given different names. 
so women didn't know each other personally. Which again, there's a lot of, you could write a book on the psychology of that, like taking away someone's identity. So I knew these were referencing specific women and their number of files. I had a feeling it was to do with vaccine trials because they were trialing vaccines on children in mother baby homes and specifically in Vesper they did, they did uh, one or two, one, in 1961. So 60, 61, you can see the dates, although the, the first part is, is, so I said, mm, I, I'm, I'm figuring these are vaccine trials. So my initial problem was the word, the, the numbers down the side. So I said there are dates, 8th of the 8th, 2002, and then the 9th of the 8th, but then it's 9803, 9804, 9805, so I was going, can I say their dates? So I reasoned, the first two sentences that are typed in, you have to type in 8802. So there's a reason that was typed in. And then if you, I went back, this is how sad I was, I went back to the, a, wor a version of Word from whatever, 2002, whatever version was out then, and I typed the first two lines in. And then when I hit, my, when I hit the last word, made the changes, I hit return, and it defaults to 9802, <coughs> and then it defaults to 9804. <coughs> so I figured the first two lines are correct. The rest <coughs> is someone hitting return and not deleting. So that was, was that enough for the date? Probably not, to go on. So I said, what can I figure out? So I went back, and this is the value of keeping records. I went back to a woman I would have written about years earlier, who I know really well now, but I have this document for donkey's years. A woman called Mary Steve, who lives in America. She was adopted to America. She was part of the vaccine trial. She was one of the first, in fact, the only person I think has been confirmed. So I was delighted. I said, I pulled this up because she said, I think I'm number 19 on one of my files. So there's a few interesting things here. First being, the file is created on the 6th of the 8th, 2002. And it's created, requested by Sister Sarto for a solicitor for the vaccine. So this file was created for a solicitor about vaccine trials, and it was created on 6th of the 8th, 2002. So the vaccine trials were investigated by the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse, but it was shut down following a Supreme Court ruling. So they, it was set up and it briefly investigated, shut down after a challenge. So in 2002, that was the time when they were investigating it. So I said, this is likely, this file was created for the Commission to Inquire to Child Abuse because they had requested information from their various religious orders on vaccine trials. So they would have asked, who were the people involved? So I went back to the Commission to Inquire to Child Abuse and I asked, when did you seek discovery of the vaccine trial records from the order in Vespera? And I hope it reads there. So there it is. The 22nd of July, 2002, they sought discovery. So, 22nd of July, 2002, they seek discovery of files relating to vaccine trials from the order. And then I have a file being created a number of weeks later, two weeks later, on the 6th of the 8th, 2002, for their solicitor about the vaccine trials. So this would have been sent, presumably, up to the Commission. And these are the details of one of the people involved. And then I have 6th of the 8th, 2002, then on the 8th of the 8th, 2002, we have checked the 20 files, made the changes. And number 19, crossed out the indoor registers, crossed out in the book, inserted Dublin after all penalties. And what's in her file? Number 19, all counties, Dublin. That's the file. So this file was created on the 6th of the 8th, 2002, sent up. And then they go back to the original files and they make the changes. And the word Dublin is inserted into the original file. So there was my story. Vaccine files were altered in 2002, two weeks after they were sought under discovery. But again, I had nothing when I had this on its own. I had to piece it together with stuff I had previously, including Mary's file, which I probably had for six or seven years and had never really written about. That's the value of keeping something because bang, it rings a bell. Years later, it makes sense. Now, it's important to note that the order have denied that any files were ever altered in any way. Um, so just putting that on the record. But the story is published, so you know, there's nothing to worry about. But uh, yeah, like, the, you know, they denied it. Um, but that was probably a front page story. Wasn't yes, it? it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we're, are, 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 um, are any of those nuns there still in Vesper? Uh, it's, cl it's closed it's since 2011, it's gone. Yeah. Um, but they're still, I mean, they're still there. Um, yeah. The two, the main ones are, they're still resident kind of behind, behind the, 
behind the main building. Well, there's an awful lot of um, kind of perseverance and legwork in that. Can you see what he's saying by cross-referencing files? This is really data journalism, isn't it, for the best? Yeah, yeah, no. And, and, and well, the killer, like that, that immediately, when I see make the changes, like everyone to tells you in this story they were changing files. Yeah. People would say, you know, their, their adoption records go, they don't look like, that doesn't look like my handwriting or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's a suspicion that's always been there. Yeah. But then you find something where it's typed up that changes were specifically made. So I was so excited when I saw it. But then you go, oh, like there's problems because I don't know what it is and what does it relate to. And that's, that, they're the worst bits. You never get anything. Yeah. That like very rarely like the tomb thing was the tomb memo was dynamite, but very rarely do you get something that is there yeah. for you. And as you say, you probably got that in the middle of a whole load of other stuff. Yeah, so it took a while to put together, but once yeah. I cross-referenced it with Mary's file, I had the dates then confirmed. I mean, two days earlier, and it's for a solicitor right when they seek discovery, which is two weeks earlier on the twenty second of July. Yeah. But again, it's it's not like it's, none of it's rocket science. It's just kind of. Patience, it's patience, and, and again, like covering yourself, you know, knowing yeah. that it's easy to just throw it out there, but you want it to be watertight, you yeah. know. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really good example. Yeah, um, and I suppose not being intimidated, isn't it, Fergal, as well, by the no, absolutely. I mean, just something I, I, I wanted to ask it's, it's a great insight into the process, um, fascinating, it, it, particularly in terms of uh, documents that aren't necessarily all the digitized either, you know, a yeah. lot of the time it's yeah. not digitized, it's not searchable. Nobody bothers. Nobody bothers with it anymore. And sometimes the, the best stuff is is it, it has to be done kind of by hand. But just one thing I wanted to, to ask you about, like you you talk about the kind of systems and institutions and systems like uh, like groups of institutions, and that's where the that's that's really where the enormity of the story is. But it, it can be very difficult to get people interested in systems as opposed to <laughs> person. Like, can you talk about that? Or is there any way that you can? Uh, like, why is that, or like, why do people? Not I don't know. Like, I always that? argue with this that the, the difficulty with it is, is I, it's a problem in the media anyway. Like, you know, everyone wants the kind of sexy headline and the straight story, and you know, X number of children in a septic tank grabs you. You know, like you want the top line, but a lot of the time, the really interesting. Like, this story suffers for its complexity, and it's like I, I, I always make the argument. I mean, I wrote a piece on it that we narrow everything down. I mean, even the even the, the inquiry is specifically focused on a certain, certain number of institutions. Whereas my argument is, it's about the treatment of women that didn't fit, that were single women, um, unmarried mothers, and their children. I mean, they did nothing wrong other than they were women. So, like, there's a children best in every county in Ireland. Yeah, like Castle Pollard, Sean Ross Abbey. Now they're all included. But say, for example, Tressa Reeves didn't go to a mother and baby home, but had the exact same experience. But she's out. She's not included in the current inquiry. So the story is, it's, it's, I, was, I made the same point when they were investigating the Magdalene Laundries. You can't look at one without looking at them all because they're all interlinked. I mean, the more you look at you see the same names crop up uh, across the board. Uh, I'm not naming any of them here, but, you know, you, you start to see a picture emerge. And that's kind of why I'm interested in the data side of things is that, like, I have so much stuff, like, the, the document, Mary's document, I didn't really write about it at the time because it was just, a at the time when I got it, it was just a, pe a piece of paper about a, her file that was created. But then it takes on an entirely new relevance when you get something years later showing that it may have, the changes may have been altered, that the file may have been altered. Do you know what part of the same there? Do you find it hard to get new editors to, 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 to keep running these stories? Do you know what I mean? To get people interested in them um, outside of, is that what you were saying, Fergus? Oh, no, I know, as in, it's yeah. hugely problematic. I mean, yeah. no, no more than uh, teaching journalism. Like, you're. I, mean, I don't know. Like, I, I suppose it, it depends on. Handle. It depends on the type of reporter you are as well. I mean, there are reporters that are that like to pitch five, six stories a day, and just and that's what they're good at. You know, I'm certainly not one of them. Um, you know, people have their strengths like that. The, the paper chair. I was saying to Mary, like, I'm not a great man for doing the one-on-one -on -one interview with the minister. I'm not great. That's not my strong suit. Like, I'm not... I, you know, I've done them, and I, but I, I always feel like I didn't do a good enough job or I, I left something out or I... You know, I'm good at paper. I'm good at finding the trends, and, um, and I'm kind of stubborn enough to stick with it, you know? Um, like, now I get... You know, they're great. The examiner have always been very good, to be fair, um, and they've always encouraged me, and probably more so since June. Yeah. They've said, you know, keep... 
tipping no, away at it, you know, yeah. keep at it. Um, but like, I suppose you have to have, it has to grab you as well personally. Like it, it is, it is an obsession of mine, definitely. Like yeah. I am very passionate on it. Um, I suppose that's a good bit of advice to write about what you're passionate about too, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, like I think, I think a, a bit of obsessiveness is a good, yeah. is a good thing in a reporter like, because you kind of have to yeah. think about it a lot. Like I wake up in the middle of the night going, Jesus, I didn't think of this or I didn't think of that. Yeah. Or, you know, um, is there some more you want to show us? Or is there no, they're all, the, they're all the files. And I suppose the last, I would make one last point is that I also got, I won't go into the details of it, but it's due to my actual laundries, is that like, you think a lot of this then is just a story and nothing happens after it, but it does make a difference. Like the Ombudsman, I have the report. Like, the Ombudsman did a report into the Magdalene Redress team recently, which took a year, and it was, maybe some people heard of it in the news, where they criticised the Redress team for basically deliberately excluding, or excluding women who should be entitled to redress. And like, that's a hundred pages. Yeah. But it was to do with um, women who were in training centres attached to Magdalene Laundry. And the right. argument of the department was, well, they weren't admitted to the laundry, even though they worked in the laundry. Yeah. yeah. They were saying it's a separate institution. Well, I found a document which said that the HSC in 2012 found evidence between Ungreenon and Hyde Park. Ungreenon was a training centre, Hyde Park was a laundry, that they were essentially one and the same thing. Right. And that, sure. that became a key part of that investigation. And then down the line, you have the ombudsman telling the department you need to change the redress them. So, like... Yeah. Sticking with it, it, it can matter in the end, you know. Um, and knowing a story very well, like you know yeah. the story very well. But like, I suppose it's good advice to them that that uh, you know, if you just do a one-off story, don't leave it there. But there no, be so yeah. many un unanswered Exactly, questions. and, and yeah. if you don't go after it, the likely yeah. it is nobody else's, you know. Yeah, but it's good as well that you you became the go-to person, the kind of the expert on this. That like people, when this story was printed actually rang you up and gave you more yeah. documents. Yeah, and that, that's, that's, that led the story on. That's definitely it. one of the, the things I got from it, is that by sticking with it for so long, people, people always pick up the phone to you yeah. or tell you have, you, have you ever thought of this or have you thought of that? Yeah. And, like, I certainly don't know everything about it, and I'm learning all the time about it. Yeah. You know? One of the few people you named there in your slides, Sister Sarto. Yeah. Was, was she a conduit of information? Is she still alive? She's still alive, yeah. Have you ever interviewed her? No. Um, I, I, I've spoken to her once, I think. Yeah, she's been interviewed a few times. Yeah, like on when the tomb stuff broke, she was interviewed because Vesper popped up. Then um, she is still alive. Yeah, <coughs> she wouldn't be um, a fan of me, I would think. Um, <laughs> no, she isn't a conduit of information for me. No, not at all. Was she the conduit of information? Is that the same one who was to link families up if they had queries? They wrote to her. Oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah. So yeah, like going back when it was operating, um, people would. You know, come from America, come from wherever to trace, they would deal with Sister Sarta, yeah. She'd be, she'd be untruthful one, so they passed on all the, a lot of false information to people. She would have been one of the nuns of some of, uh, uh, along with others and other institutions that would have been accused of people sending up people on wild goose chases and things, yeah. You've obviously heard of her before. Was she one of the people No, that's a different nun, different. yeah. But it's the same issue have cropped up around Vesper as well, um, that people would have been given misleading information and ended up running around in circles chasing people. Have you seen that film, Philomena? Do you know what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. About the, the home up in Ross Grey, where the, the woman came back to the con convent trying to trace her son, and they knew he was buried in the grounds of the, of he the paid, convent. He paid, he paid him. them he to paid be buried, them. buried there. It's really worth watching it. Okay, it's so called Philomena. It's and they were good. both looking for each other at the same time. And the nun wouldn't tell them. And he was a, he was a he really was like senior... The guy in the Reagan, Reagan government, Reagan wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And he couldn't get any information. Get from and that's a sister institution to Bespera, it's the same order of nuns. Any questions? Have you ever been in terms of legal action? Uh, yeah, yeah, loads of times, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not like, funnily enough, on this stuff, not, not, not that much. Like, uh, I've been chatting with legal action on uh, other stuff, yeah. Uh, nothing that ever progressed very far. Um, Was it just you or the examiner? Oh no, the examiner generally, yeah. Like I, I got a, I got a when I when I wrote this vaccine story, actually, I got I would normally put the queries to the, to the order through a PR company, and it's the only time in everything I've ever written about them that they've responded via a solicitor um, to say that to categorically deny that this occurred or whatever. Um, and yeah, and any time I've written the story and I haven't put in the full statement from them, they have contacted me again to say they want to stress kind of that this did not occur in the manner I say it occurred and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but yeah like solicitors letters are kind of par for the course like um, 
you know, you'll, you'll, you know, the job is you're not going to please everybody, you know. Um, and everything I've written about the debts and everything else, no, I've, I've had very little, yeah. But I, I'd say they're like, I definitely panicked when I got the first few in my career, but in general. Yeah, but the paper usually backs you up. It's easier yeah. if you work with a news organisation because they have indemnity and they have their yeah. own solicitors. It's and like stuff will be you're, legal, yeah. You're a freelancer, you know. Yeah, like stuff will be legal as well. Like if there's yeah. something, if you're working in a newspaper and you have an issue over there, as an issue, they will have like we'd, we'd have lawyers that would look at it or whatever. Anyone else? Qu- hold on, sec. There we get a mic to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah George. Yeah. Have you ever been threatened with more than legal action? <laughs> uh, um, I did write uh, I wrote I was writing something else I won't, I won't say what it was actually but uh, it was never published but um, much to my annoyance but uh, yeah a, a PR guy did ring me and loosely kind of he, he made a com- number of kind of allegations about who did I think I was and uh, he'd want to watch what I was writing and stuff like that yeah can you give a hint what it was no, 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 nothing, nothing like, nothing physical. Nothing life threatening. No, nothing life threatening. No, no. It wasn't enjoyable though. I, I got a lot of stick over it. Like, yeah, I, I didn't enjoy it a lot. Um, but I don't write crime. You know, I, I've never written anything on crime or anything. Jeez. Okay. Anyone else? Questions there? Yeah. I don't have a hunch. Anyone over here? Okay, just want to come over here. Yeah. Do you feel that the story is kind of change your life? The way it's kind of, as you say, the story is kind of, it's with you now. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, I, I, like, I'll stick with this kind of, even if I was leaving journalism, I'd stick with it. Like, you know, yeah. Because I never, I'd never, like, I did history in university. And, I mean, I never did anything in women's history. I couldn't have imagined anything more boring. And now, that's the only thing that interests me. Like, I, this is a total obsession like yeah I, if I could write nothing else all day for the newspaper it would be this yeah like I sometimes feel that the, the rest of the job gets in the way <laughs> which probably doesn't go down well but yeah it does yeah absolutely yeah okay Sloan over here I just had a question as far as how did you know what to look for because when you use that example you made it seem like it was easy and it made perfect sense but I've seen budgets and legal jargon that it takes me forever to comprehend let alone investigate so how did you know which piece together? Well, on this one, you see, like I knew there was a vaccine trial that occurred there, so I knew the general details of that because I'd written about it. So I knew that there was apparently 20 people. So there's around 19, 20 names on the list. So that kind of indicates it to me. Um, again, I knew that the, the names were redacted were house names because I, I knew the system. Again, it's just the length of time I've been writing about it. Um, how did I know to put it with Mary Steed's I rang her because I said, I think I have something to do with vaccine trials here, but I don't know. And then she said, you have my data protection request from whatever year she got it, no two. Have a look at it. And she said, I think, I, think this, I think I'm number 19. I think I was a number 19. And of course, there was a number 19 on it. The details on the number 19 matched hers. So instantly I knew, well, it's to do with the vaccine trials. And I knew it was previously briefly investigated around the year. So I rang the commission to inquire the child abuse and said, can you tell me? That's now closed, but they don't really tell you anything. Um, but I said, can you tell me when you sought discovery from the order in relation to the vaccine trials? And he directed me to this third interim report, and there it was. So it's and so, just because you had enough background in context. Yeah, so <laughs> enough background knowledge, yeah, to, to know. And but I mean, I think... Because I thought I'd never be able to... But I think, yeah. like, I think you would, you know, you would. You'd, you know, you'd, again, if you'd got it, you'd start to read around it, or you'd bring someone that you think knows, you know. I mean, I probably did it a bit quicker than some people would have done it, um, but no, I think you would, you know. I mean, once you, if you think, okay, the trick is to know was it the vaccine trials, I suppose. That was the, the key that led me in, that I knew someone who'd been in it. Um, but I still think there's a way, you know, there's always a way. Do you know what I mean? There's always a way. If, like, even if something makes no sense to you and it has something, like, that's a, a real standout line, like, you know, I mean, with me, I mean anyway, I'll, I'll just, I'll ring everybody till I figure it out. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, it might take you a while, but the trick is don't pitch it. Until you know, because you pitch it, then they want it, and then you don't have it. So yeah, like that's very good advice. Don't go into them and say, "I think I have this great story that wants you tomorrow." Yeah, yeah. If you you haven't all the bits together, don't be afraid to hold stuff back. Yeah. Until you know. Uh, Here. Yeah. Do you want to ask a question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
rest of Seamus Dooley, I think he's here for the NUJ. Oh, yeah, okay. And it's about um, source protection. God, I thought it was age. about like union matters or something. No, no, no. 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 no one's so, just uh, what takes us new scene and protecting our sources with the people in Germany? How do you mean in terms of? Well, with your email and people are phoning and it's not easy to wait to come down As in someone trying to find out who your source is. Someone from the outside. Yeah. Um, Th this is in the context of, you know that Irish independence story where they found out they brought in this English company to go through all the emails of the journalists and journalists were afraid that people could find out who they were. Oh, who they're, who they're emailing. From. Yeah, that's kind of what he's saying. Oh yeah, yeah, jeez, I hadn't thought about it. Um, like, I mean, I can only speak for my own. Uh, I mean, I could never imagine the examiner taking an mm -hmm. issue. I mean, there's never any influence coming from on high to go through our emails. I see who we're talking to. I mean, it's quite the opposite. They'd back you to the hilt. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, so, like some people might want to email you. That's that that that's that can be regular enough. Yeah, that's fine. You know, like a lot of people might send you an email. Can you ring me or whatever? Um, and in general, I wouldn't put like I, I probably wouldn't put a lot of information in emails about stuff that like there would be people I would know who are good contacts that might not necessarily have. So say, <laughs> just to give you a hypothetical, if somebody rang me and said I found this, that, or the other relating to whatever institution, and I was trying to figure out what was going on or whatever, I mean, I would have other people contacts that I would know are knowledgeable about the subject, like myself, or more knowledgeable than me, and I would ring them and put it by them, you know. I've heard that this might have happened in here. Do you know anything about this place or whatever? I wouldn't put that kind of information in an email generally because, you know, I'm kind of telling them a story and I'm telling them it on paper and I'd rather have a chat over the phone and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the other good thing, I think, they, they looked at that film, The Post, recently, and I know um, public pay phones probably seem like something out of Jurassic Park to you, but... You notice in that that the guy used a public phone when he wanted to ring a source that he didn't want anyone to know he was ringing. And there are some cases where you're better off doing that. Would you agree, Fergal, if it's something that you really need to protect yeah, someone, well, you know? The, 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 well, actually, finding one now is a difficult well, the, the modern version, of them are gone. <laughs> the modern version you're not going to get a pay phone. Uh, you know, when encrypted emails and things like that. Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, and Irish journalists, well, uh, we've had some very mysterious correspondence uh, from all these anonymous... Uh, hackers and things, wanting to speak to students about uh, just uh, setting up uh, encrypted uh, ways, means of people contacting it, you know, particularly for certain types of stories. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a new frontier, really. That's, that's it. I think, like, we're probably just, I mean, I know speaking to someone in The Guardian that I know working there um, on their data side of stuff, and she told me, like, when they were dealing with... Um, I don't know, was it like Panama paper stuff or the equivalent of something big that they were going on? She said, like, the level of security was just m mind blowing. Like, she said, they had like X kind of, you know, intelligence guys in telling them what they needed to have. They got like specific, uh, what's that thing you had there for here? USB sticks. Yes, yeah, yeah. See, I'm really clued up on this stuff. Um, <laughs> but if USB on, sticks that were like given to them, which were specifically like protected and. I mean, I don't think there's any Irish media organisation that's operating on that level. No, but that's, I mean, the, that's a financial... The public pay phone was the precursor to that. Which, uh, yeah. yeah, but it's never any harm to me. Like, I think as a general rule anyway, and it's probably dying out a lot in journalism, is, is getting out of the office and meeting people. Like, people are always likely to give you more information when they know who you are. Yeah, face-to-face. Um, face-to-face, and if they like you. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, if people don't talk to you... Uh, I find well maybe it's just me but uh, I mean I remember emailing somebody who I got their information that worked in a specific place um, <laughs> and I wanted to talk to her and see what she tell me anything and I emailed her solidly for about a year not to like st you know stalk her levels or anything but I dropped her like regular emails to say look you've seen what I've done uh, people can vouch for me and eventually she relented and met me for coffee and I've met her a good few times since and you know again yeah. like that's you know, it's you might never get a story, you might get one yeah. in two years, but it, if they meet you and they see, because a lot of people I think think journalists, it's a big bad thing, all they see is a newspaper on page, but like when they meet you, they say, you're just another person doing their job, or, and that you're... Well, you you're, have to build up trust. Yeah, right? and that you're in it yeah. for the right reasons, and you're doing something for the right reasons, you're not just a, 
a yeah. hack trying to screw somebody over or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, will we take a final question, so anyone else? Okay, Simon, yeah? Um, Just a sec there, now to get the mic, yeah. You mentioned that you have to kind of combine your investigative duties with other general stuff. I'm just wondering, would you like to be just a sole investigative reporter, maybe somewhere else, an examiner, get headhunted or something? Yeah. It just no, it kind of seems strange because usually people like, if they get kind of high profile, that maybe someone else would come in and take them and they go, do you know, kind of. Yeah, I know high profile though. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I suppose uh, like. My skill set probably is, is suited to this type of work, you know, like I'd say my background was history and I'm, I'm like, I, I do like, I am sad enough that when I get a, an FOI or I get documents into my hand, I get a kind of a buzz out of it and I like going through it and I like when it doesn't make sense to me and I like trying to figure it out. Um, not every reporter is that, like, I, like for example, I'd be a terrible freelance reporter where you have to, you know, come up with stories all the time and I would be dreadful at that. Like that's just not me at all. But then there are other people that are great at that. Um, so I think it's probably just my skill set and my personality draws me to uh, probably stories like this and my kind of obsessive nature in a lot of ways makes me stick with it. And um, So I think it's kind of a mix of my skills and my personality really more than anything else. Like would I like to do it all the time? 100% yeah. yeah. There's not enough resources. Geez, you're asking me tough ones now. Um, probably not, no. Um, I, I, like, I think it's getting harder to do the job, yeah. I think there's, you know, you have to, every newspaper is, is, is struggling from people aren't buying them as much as they used to. Everyone gets their information for free online. Um, to me, that hurts real journalism. I think ultimately, uh, just because somebody said it on Twitter doesn't really mean anything. Um, real journalism requires... Our journalism that matters, that exposes stuff, requires time and it requires investment and it requires effort and oftentimes a lot of dead ends and a lot of getting nowhere. Um, and that's not, I suppose in the modern world, that's not something that people invest in easily because it isn't instant results, um, which is probably why more news is, is kind of, uh, there's a lot of entertainment based news and quicker stuff and instant news and but a lot of that's kind of ephemeral like it's very here today it's just of the day it's to me it's again it's by obsession with the narrative it's just reporting on what was said and that to me is kind of not really interesting or exciting well i think that's a probably a good note to end on listen thanks very much Carl. no problem <laughs> I hope so, yeah. They're I all doing so. their FOIs and their 